So far, we have described the electrons on two different levels. The first one was the Trude model, in which we used classical physics and we used the uh, ideal gas thermodynamics to describe the, this, uh, the distribution of energies and velocities. We said that this is not quite the right description of our system since electrons are not classical particles, but they are fermions and thereby they follow Fermi-Dirac statistics. And so we introduced the Sommerfeld model two weeks ago in which we ended up by deriving the heat capacity of electronic cloud and some basic properties. The free electron gas, as we have described it, was characterized by the fact that there were no interactions between electrons and no interactions between the electrons and atoms. This is the origin, or this is the reason why we call it free electrons. The electrons are not bound by any interaction. We know that electrons in real material are, of course, interacting with each other. They interact with the lattice, with the atoms, that eventually distinguishes one material from the other material. And so we need to take this into account. And so we will try to do it today. We'll build the methodology how to do it. And we'll end up with considering weak interaction between electrons and atoms. The nearly free electrons uh, links or points us towards the fact that we will start describing the free electrons, but now in the periodic lattice. And then we will have the opportunity to turn the knob and switch on the potential, potential representing interaction, interaction between electrons and nuclei, and therefore observe what changes of the electronic behavior we obtain with this interaction. So as I said, we will start with a perfect lattice. We start with crystalline material. We do not consider any defects, any point defects, any dislocations, any stacking faults, anything. We just have a perfect crystal. This is our starting point. And in fact, this is what we will be stuck from now till the end of the lecture. A single electron in such a crystal is following or is, um, is described by a, uh, by, by a wave function, which is a solution of one particle Schrodinger equation with a Hamiltonian that contains two parts. It contains an operator corresponding to the kinetic energy of this one electron and a potential energy corresponding to all interactions between this one electron of interest and all the rest of the world. The uh, potential that describes the interactions of this one electron with all rest of the world is lattice periodic. This is now our assumption and this is the, again, nature of perfect crystalline material. If I move by any crystal vector, my environment, my interactions, my surroundings will be exactly the same. The crystal is infinitely large and I can't recognize any change if I move from one lattice point to another lattice point or even more generally, if I'm simply moved by a lattice vector. In what follows, I will be using the nomenclature where capital R always represents lattice vector. So this is when I move by a vector representing the lattice periodicity, not necessarily the shortest one, okay? any lattice vector. It turns out 
that our solutions in this case can be described in a form of so-called block states. What are those block states? Uh, Bloch's theorem states that the equation, uh, the, the solutions of the Schrodinger equation of single electron in a periodic potential, this is important, so we have a periodic potential, uh, is of the form that is a product of a plane wave and a lattice periodic function. We do not say that the solution itself is a lattice periodic function. It doesn't have to be. But what is important to state is that it is expressed as a product of lattice periodic function and a plane wave. What does that mean? I have at the bottom here this schematic 1D case. The blue curve is a plane wave. This is simply a periodic function. This expresses our exponential function that we have here. And then we take a lattice periodic function. The red points here, they are lattice sides. And so I need a function which looks exactly the same in each and every environment of these points. So if I try to take such a function, I can't draw it good enough, but hopefully you believe me that I'm trying to make there always four small humps in between. And the fifth one is larger exactly at the atomic position. This is a lattice periodic function. This will be representing our function U N K. Now, when I multiply those two functions, the blue and the red curve, I get the black curve that I have here at the bottom. So this one, where actually the amplitude is modulated by the lattice, by, by the plane wave, by the blue curve. So if you look at the black curve, you eventually see there some kind of a periodicity because you see that there is always the peak if present right at the position of the lattice point but at the same time you see that this is not a lattice periodic function because if i move from one red point to another red point i do not have exactly the same function so this is a very special construct we will call this a block state or blocks function and Eventually, it provides us with a recipe for which type of functions we should search our solutions of the Schrodinger equation for. Once again, all of this holds true in the case of lattice periodic cases. So we need to have a lattice periodic potential. This is the crucial thing, right? If we do not have lattice periodic potential, we move away from crystalline material to amorphous material, we move to isolated atoms and so on. Then, in fact, the Bloch theorem is not true. And we have to find the solutions as perturbations to the Bloch theorem. And the whole thing is complicated and beyond our basic solid physics course. This, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this function is called after Felix Bloch, who was a Swiss physicist living in the first half or in the, almost the whole 20th century and one of the Nobel Prize awardees, namely for the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1952. All right, so we have now a lattice periodic potential, we also know in what form should we search for the solutions. The solutions are lattice periodic functions. So let's try to work all of this information together 
and combine it and see what comes out of that. In the first place, we recognize that having a lattice periodic potential, we can expand it into Fourier series. If this potential was a 1D fu function, then you would immediately suggest that we can write it as a sum, a weighted sum of sine and cosine functions of different frequencies. Well, that is eventually what we do here. We have a sum of sine and cosine functions. And for each frequency, which is related to the lattice vector, k equals 2 pi, or should I write here better, g, oh, what have I done just now? I apologize. This is not what was intended. Um, g equals 2 pi over lambda, and lambda can be, of course, related to the, uh, to the frequency, right? So we have then um, velocity, let's label it c, times uh, period, which is c over frequency. Okay, so all of this and, and would be even better than uh, that this frequency is uh, uh, omega over 2 pi. So we would get here c times 2 pi over omega. Right? So all of this can be put together. And uh, you have the weights in this Fourier series expansion given by these Fourier coefficients. The only complication that we do here is now that we have a 3D lattice. We do not have just one dimensional case. So our function u depends on a position r, which is a vector in three dimensional space. And therefore, it needs to be three dimensional periodic, means our reciprocal space, the space of the uh, lattice vectors and frequencies, corresponding frequencies. This is a three-dimensional lattice. This is the well-known reciprocal lattice that we have already met. And we need to do the 3D Fourier series. Good, this is one step. The next step is now to apply the knowledge of uh, the form of the solutions. So we know that we are searching for our solutions. These are the solutions that we look for. And we know that they must be in the form of the Bloch's function. Why? Because we search for solutions of Schrodinger equation that corresponds to a potential, which is lattice period, right? So if we can do this, we can do this as well. Now, we have the plane wave. This is absolutely easy function. What is missing to describe is now this part, the UK, which is the lattice periodic function. But this, again, should be relatively simple. It is a lattice periodic function. All the aperiodicity of the, uh, of the function we have sort of extracted outside into the plane wave. And so this lattice periodic function can be similarly to the potential expand it into Fourier series. So for each of those functions, we write it as a Fourier series, and we write it namely as a Fourier series of coefficients, C times E I K R. Now this should be capital K, all right? And the coefficients of this expansion are labeled with this reciprocal capital K vector. And all what we have done here is then we said, well, each of those coefficients for capital K might be a function of small k. Because eventually we see that this lattice periodic function also depends on the plane wave vector. Right? So eventually we label it, for example, that these coefficients C capital K are functions of small k. Or equivalently, because those are both reciprocal lattice vectors, we simply label the 
indices or the, these weights, we label them as C capital K plus small k. And the advantage is that now the vector that we use here or the index that we use here is the identical with what we have here in the uh, exponential function. The small k here came from the plane wave prefect, right? So a product of two exponential functions is a exponential function with an argument that is sum of the two arguments of the uh, exponential functions. So what we have done here is we rewrote this form into this one. Having this, we can put everything together. We end up with such a complicated equation. I may try to write it down here um, so that we are not so scared of it, right? So what we are doing is again, our Hamiltonian equals minus h bar squared nabla squared over 2m plus ur. This is the function. So this was the single particle, single electron Hamiltonian that we started with. Now we enter here the Fourier series for the potential plus, and that was a sum over G over all reciprocal lattice vectors, U, G, P, I, G, R. So this is now how the Hamiltonian looks like. And we let the Hamiltonian act on a function psi. How does the function psi look like again? Psi is a sum over all capital K of co uh, and coefficient C capital K plus small k times E to I capital K plus small k. So now we need to let the Hamiltonian H act on this function psi. When we do that, we will see that the nabla squared is second derivative of the function. So eventually from this first part and the sum, we arrive at h squared over 2m is this part here. The second derivative takes me out of this argument i squared k plus k squared. i squared is minus one, which together with this minus gives me plus. So I have plus one here, sum over all capital K, k plus k squared. This is this part squared. The coefficient is still there. It's a constant that stays. And then we have again the exponential function. So this first part corresponds to the acting of the kinetic energy part of the Hamiltonian on our expected solution in the form of the Bloch's function. Equivalently, this second part is just a combination of the two sums, right? It's the combination of these two sums in which we end up with a double sum over capital K and G, always a product of the Fourier coefficient of our potential, UG, the Fourier coefficient of our solution, CK plus K, and then one exponential function. On the right hand side of the Schrodinger equation, we have the function, uh, sorry, we have the energy, so the eigenstate uh, of our Hamiltonian, the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, and again, the same function. So we have here the function psi that we start. So this complicated formula that we have here might look complicated, but at the end of the day, it's just very simple algebra provided that we accept the Bloch's theorem and that we know what is Fourier series and why we can apply it to our potential. After a little bit of algebra, which we 
may actually do here. I'll try to do that here. So I'll leave here this space. What we would like to do now is to put together all the coefficients of the same exponential function, right? So if we put this part in this part together that we can do right away, yeah? Then we have on the left-hand side, we have sum over capital K, and then we have H bar over two M, K minus K squared, minus E K, this whole thing times C K plus K E E K plus K, well, one of them is capital K, the other one is small K, all Ks are with vectors, but uh, I will not. Okay, so this is these two terms together, plus, And now we write again that we have a sum over k. And then we have what? We take out everything which depends only on k uh, outside. So we would like to have here that we have, uh, right, but we need to write it in the form of the of the coefficient. So we will then write here, uh, I delete the second sum for the time being. And now we write it in this funny form that we say we have here um, e to the power of i. And let me write it instead of k actually as uh, alpha plus k, where alpha is now k plus g. You will see in a second why we can do this, times r. Then we have here coefficient c, and then we need to write K, capital K, is then alpha minus G plus K. And then we have the coefficient U, G. Sum over all G vectors is equal to zero. Now what I can do is dirty trick, since I do have these sums, both of them, over all reciprocal vectors, I can also rename them. And let's say, instead of summing over i equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, I can be summing over j, which is i plus 3, and j goes over 0, 1, 2, 3. Right? So I can actually equivalently rewrite this, that this is a sum not over K, but sum over alpha. That will be mathematically spanning, spanning the same range of summons. And then if I do one more trick to confuse you, and that is to rename the index alpha back into K, capital K. So I will end up here with capital K and here I will end up with capital K uh, minus G plus small k. What do I end up with if I look at all of this is, now I have to uh, delete this bottom part probably. I should this, if I can actually delete this. Never deleted so many things. Good. So we will then end up here with a sum over capital K. And this is now our green K. So let's stay with the green K. That's the one that we have renamed K to alpha and then back to K. 
And then we had there C K minus G plus K U G E I K plus K R. And there must be also a sum over G here equals to zero. Mm -hmm. So now I can take this sum over capital K and put everything together. So I will finally end up with sum over capital K. That's a question that I will be able to remember this H bar over 2M k plus k squared minus e k c k plus k plus sum over g c k minus g plus small k times u g and all of this times e to i k plus k, so one of them is the capital one, times r equals zero. Hopefully there are not mistakes in here. What we are eventually saying, if you look at all of those things, complicated things in, in the front, we have eventually some constant here, as a function of k. So we ended up with a bit of imagination with a sum over capital K times something, I label it again alpha, I'm running out of ideas, of a capital K times E i k minus k plus k times r equals zero. So what is this? This is Fourier series, right? So this describes a function which is lattice periodic with the same periodicity as of our uh, of our lattice, right? This is the sine and cosine, and here we ended up with some factors with some weights of this Fourier expansion. Now we are saying that this Fourier series, this Fourier uh, expansion is equal to zero. Or in other words, that this lattice periodic function is everywhere independent of what is the argument is equal to zero. Well, then we have only two uh, possibilities what can be happening. Either this part is equal to zero or this part is equal to zero for each k. Well, the second part is obviously not equal to zero for each k that we know. So the only option how we can fulfill this equation, this one, which is just rewritten Schrodinger equation, so if we want to fulfill Schrodinger equation, the requirement that we have now is that those coefficients are equal to zero for each and every capital K. And this finally brings us to what we have in this function, which looks almost like what I have written there. There was uh, one more rewriting or renaming the index G in the sum. But other than that, this part here is what I have labeled as alpha capital K. And then we say that these must be equal to zero for each and every reciprocal vector K. So eventually, let us sum up what we are doing, why we do that, and where we are. We are trying to solve Schrodinger equation. Schrodinger equation for one electron, but one electron in a periodic potential. 
knowing that it's a periodic potential, we have expanded it in Fourier series. Good. And we also know that our solution can be found in the form of Bloch's state. The Bloch state is a product of line wave defined by a small k, by the, lattice, by the wave vector, and a lattice periodic function. And again, we have lattice periodic function, so we take advantage of Fourier series and we expand this lattice periodic function in Fourier series. That means the lattice periodic part of the block solution is fully determined by the coefficient CKK. If we know these coefficients, we know how to construct the lattice periodic part of the block's function UKR. Well, to multiply it by a plane wave is a trivial thing. And we have our solution, which is what we are actually interested in, right? The slight problem in applying all the methods that we have learned in linear algebra is that now the system of equations is infinitely large. The system of coefficients, the number of unknowns is infinite. Why? Because all of those coefficients, sorry, those ones, CK, are unknowns. And what are those coefficients? Well, those are the coefficients in the Fourier expansion. We know that Fourier series are infinite series. So this is now the bottleneck, right? We have transformed the a partial differential equation into a set of linear equations. That's good news. And good news is that eventually uh, the all, all the quantum mechanical solutions are now transformed into diagonalizing of a matrix. Bad news is that the dimension of this matrix and the size of this uh, system of linear equations is infinite. We have to do something about So first, let us have a look. What will we get if we have free electrons? This is the solution that we know already from the uh, Sommerfeld model. And we know that in that case, the energy of the system was parabolic function, right? This was the solution that we have obtained last week. So essentially the energy of an electron is simply the kinetic energy of the electron, the solutions per plane waves. Let's have a look what we get now in this treatment when we look at this uh, sort of limiting case when we really switch off the potential interaction. Well, then we end up that the secular equation we had on the previous slide has to simplify a little bit. There are no more the parts corresponding to the Fourier series of the potential. Nevertheless, for each capital K, we obtain a func uh, an equation of this form. And in order to fulfill this, we have two options. Either the first part of the product is equal to zero or the second part of the product is equal to zero. Um, of course, we can say that all of those coefficients are identically equal to zero. That is fine. But what does that mean? Well, that means that our uh, plane wave, uh, that the solution is in the form of a plane wave times the lattice periodic function. And now all of those are equal to zero. It means our solution is identically equal to zero. And that means it does not represent any electron. The probability of finding an electron somewhere or actually in the whole space is equal to zero. So we must have for at least one coefficient, we need to have that the first part of this product is equal to zero. And that means that our uh, energy of the system, so the eigenvalue of the Schrodinger equation is equal to h bar uh, k squared uh, over 2m, which is 
identical to our solution that we obtained last week or two weeks ago for in the, in the summer fault model. If uh, this happens only for one capital K, then we call this a non-degenerate solution. If it happens for more cases, then we would have n-degenerate solutions. We can start to think about uh, the band structure, so the dispersion relationships, the function epsilon or not epsilon a k as a function of k for such a system of free electrons. Right? So we know that one electron that would be essentially described by the by the parabola, and now we can plug in the parabolas that are in neighboring unit cells and look at the final band structure. Well, the band structure then is eventually nothing else than this one parabola being folded backwards in the first reciprocal space. Or a first, reci a first brilliant, sorry, the first brilliant zone, not reciprocal space, the first brilliant zone of the reciprocal space. So eventually what we see here is that if you imagine that this is your reciprocal space that we have here, we here we have the first Brulein zone and at the origin of this first Brulein zone, we put a parabola. Good, that is the parabola that is described here okay, by this function. Now the parabola at some point hits as, uh, at the boundary of the Brillian zone, the first Brillian zone. And so we either can be describing it by going outside of the Brillian zone, or we restrict to the first Brillian zone and look what else contributes to the allowed energy states in the first Brillian zone. And that would be a parabola, which is located at the next unit cell, next Brillian zone which looks like this. And so exactly from this point, we have a parabola which goes up, which is a mirror image of this branch mirrored with respect to the Brillian zone boundary. And so our parabola, when we go like that upwards, is now mirrored and we get here this branch that we have here. And the same thing, we can now look at the other directions. So for example, at the point M, we would know that there are four parabolas in this 2D example that meet here. So along the direction from gamma to M from here, we have, uh -huh, and I was drawing the wrong parabola. What I was drawing here before was from gamma to X, right? So this was, and that was the one mirror image, sorry. For now from gamma to M, we have just one uh, branch that meets here. At the M point, we have four, we have four branches that meet here, okay? So we have the parabola, these four parabolas that meet there. Now, if I go from M point up uh, above this curve, that means that I will continue the parabola from this point that comes from the point M, backwards towards point gamma in the first reciprocal space. If I look at the projections of the parabolas from these two centers along the gamma M direction, they will be identical because the gamma M direction is symmetrically positioned for both of these parabolic centers. And the Energy as a function of the position in the reciprocal space or in the first Brillian zone will be described by this branch here. So this is contribution of this parabola and this one along this red line. That means that along this line, I have actually doubly degenerate solutions. For each of these energies, I can have 
electrons that correspond to the uh, solutions or to the parabola coming from this center as well as coming from this center. And this is the way how I will eventually build up my band structure, the dispersion relationship, the dependence of the energy of the uh, eigenvalue of the Schrodinger equation um, or the Hamiltonian as a function of the small k. And again, what is the small k, the wave vector? This is the label that I use uh, for as a wave vector in my plane wave when I apply the uh, blocks theorem. So for each of these small k, I can find one lattice periodic function, u or several of them uk that I have then described. For each of those, I get some solutions, some, some allowed energies. If finally you look along this axis, which is the energy axis, then you can conclude that for each of those energies, you will find an intersection with at least one of those branches. What does that mean? It means that there is for each of an energy that I can imagine, I will find a corresponding state or states. In other words, there is no forbidden energy. All energies correspond to some allowed states for electrons. If you now think one step ahead to what we will say in a second, it means that we do not have any band gap, any band of forbidden energies. And therefore we can't have any semiconductors described using purely free electrons. So let's now make uh, relatively quickly the conclusion, what happens when we have only uh, nearly free electrons? That means that the potential is very weak. Potential U as a function of R is very weak. When we do the Fourier expansion, there will be only very few non-zero coefficients. We can, without a loss of generosity, we can put the u0, so the constant term, we can put it to zero. We can set our overall potential, the lowest potential, go to zero. This is eventually just a constant addition in the Schrodinger equation. Uh, other than that, it means that there are only a few coefficients for which the uh, for which I need to consider explicitly also the potentials, the Fourier coefficients of the potential. And if we now assume a very simplistic case, when we say we have only two branches, only two of those uh, bands that meet at the Brulein zone boundary, and here we let them interact, these two electrons that come, or that are described by this branch and by this branch. So the potential is weak, and only in this region, the uh, only one non-zero component of the Fourier expansion is, uh, uh, is present, then we actually end up with these two solutions being coupled, coupled in the form that the solutions corresponding to the one branch and corresponding to the other branch, which both of them were assumed to be parabolic, as they would be in the form of the free electrons, they are now coupled. It will eventually lead to the uh, non-zero solution of 
this set of equations that we have here it means if we want to have a non-zero solution it means both of these coefficients should be non-zero the corresponding determinant of the coefficients must be equal to zero which leads to the uh, condition or to the equation that we end up here with the determinant equal to zero, which eventually leads to the sol solution that the energy at the Sproulin zone boundary is equal or at the point where these two branches actually cross each other is equal to the mean value of those two branches, which these would be eventually in the free electron solution would be equal to a e e1 so e1 k because this was our assumption that those two branches in the free electron case they would be identical they are crossing there but now we see that at this point exactly at the point k where they would be crossing we have now splitting of the energy by plus minus um, Fourier coefficient squared. That means that our band structure, which looked originally like this, and here we had second branch going like that. Here we had the cross. Now it splits exactly at this point. We do not have a doubly degenerate solution. Instead of that, one of those goes down, the other one goes up, and we end up with a branch which looks like this, and the second one looking like that. And eventually, here we had a window of energies which do not correspond to any state, at least not any state coming from those two branches. So finally, by removing the degeneracy at the band crossing, we end up with band gaps. We end up with uh, separating a bands of energies with existing or allowed states and uh, bands of energies with not allowed states. And eventually we end up with possibility for having semiconducting behavior meaning that the, for the first time in our whole treatment from Prude to Sommerfeld model and now to nearly free electrons, the existence of weak, but at least existence of the, uh, but, but nevertheless existence of the interaction with the atoms, between the electrons and atoms, this interaction, it can lead to opening of gaps lead to existence or um, generate existence of bands with forbidden energies. And more often we do not speak about the bands of forbidden energies, instead we speak about bands of energies. So we would say this is a band in which the energies or band of energies for which the states exist, the corresponding states, and then we have another band of energies here. This is the fact, or this is the reason why the dispersion relationship, dispersion relation function that, that we have here is called band structure. So we have the bands of energies leading to the band structure. And I think this is the very end of today's lecture, many times interrupted. I see a typo here for which I apologize immediately. So the take home message here is that when we assume we are looking for a solution of the Schrodinger equation for single electron, we still have single electron, please, but single electron in a periodic potential, we can transform the 
potential into Fourier series. We know that we are looking for a solution in the form of Bloch's state, which transforms the Schrodinger equation from partial differential equation into a system of linear equations. It is infinitely large system, but it is a system of linear equations. The existence of solution or our requirement for solution of the uh, of existence of the solution leads to additional condition that each of these uh, one coefficients or, or one of these parts in the in the sum final sum must be equal to zero which will provide us with the uh, with the relationship for ek which is the uh, energy dispersion relationship and also known as the band structure. The EK is the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, the total energy operator uh, for the given solution. We have checked our treatment on the case where we then set the, uh, the, the potential equal to zero. Uh, by which we have switched it off and we ended up again with the perfectly parabolic dispersion relationships and the plane wave solutions as we derived it last week or two weeks ago for the Sommerfeld model. And to simplify the whole complicated treatment a little bit to get some insight, we said that if we can think about weak potential in which the Fourier expansion of this potential can be terminated after basically the second term. Then at the bent crossings, when we get that two of the solutions uh, have very similar dispersion relationships, uh, we then eventually ended up with having their one cross term linking these two solutions. This cross term is related to this one non-zero, weak non-zero um, Fourier component of the expansion of the potential. And that led eventually to the opening of band gaps, the gaps between the bands of allowed energies. And at the end of the day, it led to the principle allowance or, or allowing for existence of semiconducting materials for the first time.